Hey, what's up? Uh, Karen Gorm, I actually got a guest here today, which isn't Harris, who knew? Um, I don't know if you, it was Josh, you want yeah. to introduce yourself? Or? Yeah, I'm Josh from um, Headstand, uh, we're a coffee leaf company. That was very succinct, you said <laughs> yeah. that before, elevator pitch. Yeah, that's um, all we do. Nice, I'm going to go with some real quick fire ones here. Well, if people don't already know about Headstand, uh, we sell the cans in our shops. Um, they're super delicious, super great, um, and we can delve pretty deep in like what it is and what it's about and like how do you start it in a bit, but I had some really yeah. quick fire ones, so I'm quite do curious. It. What's the worst thing about working in coffee? Oh, uh, I want to bring it down and then The worst part. I mean, I, I do think that like, now that I've been in it for so long, you see the same conversations come up like every five years and you feel like there's like collective amnesia. Yeah. And then you're just, and like, so I'm feeling, so it makes you feel your age really intensely because you're like, you hear a bunch of baristas talking about. Well, they disappear and then they research. Yeah, like so. the same thing just kind of comes up yeah. again and you're kind of like, I Everything think we cyclical. figured this out. Yeah, I thought we yeah. figured, and then they're like, oh, they got to figure it out themselves. So sometimes that's it can a, feel a little bit dry. Like you know, we're talking about branding. It's like, yeah. you know, everything is cyclical. Cyclical? Cyclical. Mm. Um, it, you know, something becomes uncool and then it becomes cool again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Five years, yeah. Yeah, like the fact that like low-rise uh, jeans are in, I'm just like, I yeah. thought we figured this out with like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no one looks good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, like fashion must be the biggest one, really. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. That's, <laughs> what's the best thing about working coffee? Um, yeah, I think that, cyclical. yeah, it's, it's cool. so fucking so great. Easy to predict. <laughs> once, yeah, <laughs> once you're into it, you're into it. No, but I think uh, I most people can probably get like paid to do other industries more, and so pretty yeah. much everyone's in it because they actually really like, want to be in the industry. Yeah, that's there, true. it isn't. I like when I speak to like my friends who are like an accountant or something. There's a lot of like, I hate my job. Yeah. Uh, why am I like? What is this? Well, I think at coffee, a lot of people are like, no, no, I really love this. I just want to like figure out how to make it work. So yeah, that's cool. It's nice to have that I sort think of like on, on, on that strain of thought, though, it, it, it can sometimes be a challenge. When I think about music, yeah. uh, like I spent, I started music at okay. uni, and I was like, I'm going to be a musician. Right. It's never going to happen. Well, that's how you got in coffee, because it goes music, yeah. arts, and 100%. then you're like, fuck, that didn't work. Yeah. Coffee. But like, um, there was no way I was ever going to make that work. But now, like tomorrow night, mm -hmm. I'm having a jam with some of my friends, and it's like, yeah. that's be kind of becoming fun again. Right. But uh, like, money makes things unfun. But yeah. um, <laughs> coffee, I feel like, yeah, if you don't have that passion, it isn't always the highest paid um, industry to, to be engaged with. So yeah. I guess it can be quite challenging. Mm -hmm. You kind of need to enjoy what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Because like, that is like the, you know, like I say, the sole thing about being yeah. in finance that probably makes it sweet is the fact you yeah. can afford to buy a flat. And, yeah, you work in the city or something yeah. and you're just like, this is great. But Let's yeah. go inside. We made it here. You didn't trip over. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, I think like, um, the Glasgow one now is uh the unofficial scottish one yeah and uh, i think everyone's bought into that and mm. it felt like it was quite like a a widespread community now it was like scotland coming to that festival yeah it wasn't just like glasgow people or you know edinburgh people coming over from glasgow it was like it was more than that really? uh and i think that's always uh like the the concern is the coffee scene doesn't only exist in edinburgh and glasgow mm. uh the same way that i'm sure people who live down south don't want to buy into the fact it only exists in London yeah maybe I don't know maybe it does but I don't think you know uh there'll be a lot of people in the Midlands and uh who have something to say about that you know and I think uh yeah it was just nice it was nice to have a community where um yeah everyone just felt like they were on the same page yeah yeah and it was like I don't know no, I tell you it was like a really it was an incredibly nice vibe and it's it, the UK is really funny for how many coffee festivals there are like no like Ireland doesn't even have a coffee festival which is wild like it's so it's it's really amazing how it localizes it. I think it can be quite easy to go like, oh God, do we need another one in like another small town? But I, I think that there is something nice in the idea that so many cafes and so many people like to buy local. Yeah. And like coffee's funny because it's not a local product, mm -hmm. but like they do want to buy local. And so to have that opportunity that if you're in like Newcastle, I knew like there's Newcastle Coffee Festival or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that there's like that chance to go actually and see yeah. it. It's well, like, like um, obviously London is its own beast, but like Cup North was, yeah. for me, like in Scotland, was like the, probably the first festival I went to and like uh, it was incredible. I think they're now involved with Glasgow to some degree, but um, yeah, I didn't make it out to London. Did you have a stand? Yeah. Oh, no, like I did like pop-up stuff on stands. It's, it's just, it's like, it's cool. It's just so intense and it's so, I don't know. It's like, I don't know if it, 
has it needs to like figure out what it is and how to get because it's really expensive to have a stand. So you tend to get big machine companies that do it. So consumers come in and do they have an interest in a fifteen thousand pound commercialist? I don't like it. Yeah. It's, it I think there's a lot of like what is this thing and maybe how do we make it more manageable and make it more um like more orientated for smaller businesses i guess i, I know they roasters village with lamazoka does some good stuff with that uh-huh. and uh other people do a lot of like pop-ups which i've done before which was really nice but i think it's yeah i think this i like that i love the regional ones i just really like and also the uk is just like in canada there's not as much regional stuff that happens like yeah. this and i just love how it's celebrated here that's cool yeah, yeah i think like the the cost of entry is quite like a wide topic but obviously um the ukbc is like another one or yeah. just competition in general where it's like how do they engage more yeah like brands out with the kind of core already competing roasteries that they can yeah. maybe afford it better than others we had like kyle competed with a quite a on the face of it well we didn't realize i didn't realize but i kind of kind of maybe had an instinct but yeah but it was quite cheap coffee Right. And uh, he did pretty well with it. But then we yeah. went down to finals and was like, yeah, hearing what some people would spend on copies, it was quite uh, blown away. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do, I'm a little bit more on the side that I'm okay with that cost because if we're trying to create something that's like the best of an industry, yeah, I think it's okay that it, it does have a cost to it. I do think that like, there's a line though, you see people who will spend uh, like it costs you know, 10, 15,000 pounds to win or something like, I, I think it, it doesn't nearly need to be that expensive, mm-hmm. but I do think it does need to be like, it makes sense that the best coffees in the world cost more. They're still way cheaper than like, even like not that ex- high end wines. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like, I think we're still at the cheaper end of like, I don't know when a lot of coffee is less than an iPhone. I'm kind of, I don't know. Maybe it's okay that that's the best coffee in the world. Yeah. And that's an okay price. I guess like the, the um the complication comes when uh and it's not really compl- but if you develop staff um, yeah to an extent where they're highly capable of competing at that level but maybe your infrastructure for your business is yeah too small that it's like oh, it's just an expense we can't afford it's like the the uh and it's not something that keeps me up at night too much <laughs> but it's like you know you you want to develop people as far as they can and often that means letting go of them mm. is pretty tough um i mean i think brewer's cup helps with that um yeah. same with cup taste like i think that's there's enough other stuff that people can do that it doesn't have to just be barista but it is i think there is de- definitely like a hard spot in shops where there's only so much that you can get paid as salary as a barista or working in a shop that you end up at this like ceiling and then the business not in a mean way or in a, like a, a horrible way is kind of like we just can't offer you more there isn't another thing to do um there's just this yeah. um and it is always like a sad and hard point but it's it's i think it's quite natural it's like yeah. that so many things yeah fair enough so talking about developing yeah. careers <laughs> like uh for anyone who maybe doesn't know do you want to give us like a quick i mean i've obviously scoped your link to linkedin out completely um and i'm sure there's a lot of uh not trivial, but like barista jobs and stuff you've done prior to the ones that made the cut on LinkedIn. <laughs> like I've got a lot of like failures that I just don't exist in my public domain. But... I love like LinkedIn serious. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, those five years didn't exist. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sure you didn't just start as a head, head, uh, head of yeah. coffee, but um, like what was your career looked like yeah. to get to where you're at now? Yeah, so I was, uh, I started uh, as a barista when I was 16 was my first and I just never left coffee. It was a, like in my small town in Canada, worked at like the local coffee shop and then moved to Toronto, worked in coffee, moved to Australia, learned how to roast, um, spent some time back in Canada doing more kind of cafe. That's where I started more competition t- style things and kind of really got into the coffee competitions. I think in an era where it was sort of the way you would differentiate your career, like as you could get jobs off the back of winning competitions, which I think is maybe like going away as a thing. But, um, and so if it just kind of proved that you were like super serious and you knew a lot about coffee. Um, and so did the Canadian uh, brisk competitions and then came over here and did the British ones and lucky enough to win that. Um, were they do, like Brewers Cup and UKBC or? Yeah, yeah, so just, like brewers in Canada, yeah. and then uh, then coming over here and do, doing the UKBC, which was really fun, and then roast, spending a lot more time roasting coffee for a lot of people who competed, um, which was a really kind of funny era of like trying to like <laughs> have as much of your coffee and do well as possible. That's like the yeah. interesting uh, thing now is um, like the the 
the team with like the the, the, the kind of uh, periphery yeah. elements of like what makes up a com, com, like a competitor is uh, really crucially important as well. Like mm. you know, Ian Kissick's team are like high end coffee professionals. Yeah. Because well. um, not everyone necessarily wants to put themselves out there and compete, but there there is a lot of touching points where you can get involved with the competition. I guess through totally. Like, and I think the team kind of gets some. Like it, it should be more orientated as a team sport because it really is this like maybe not sport but like it is definitely like you can only do so good with the coffee has to be good the roasting yeah. has to be good the you know the practice that you actually do but it, it then it's quite centralized around uh the, just the competitor and yeah. uh, that can be kind of i guess tough if you're maybe a coach or something and you spend a lot of time doing it yeah sure yeah. I feel like I don't know why I keep on gravitating towards competition as a topic. Yeah. It's not at all what I was intending to chat to you about. But, yeah. um, so you started off your barista in Canada, moved over to Australia, yeah. started doing some roasting there. Yeah. And then when you came, was it the next step to the UK? Yeah, I stopped in Canada for a couple more years um, and then moved to the UK. I worked uh, at Origin, worked at, uh, like, ran the coffee program over there. And did you, like, elevate through the ranks there? Or was you just... Um, it came on, it's like, it was, it's funny, I guess, like, the titles changed, but it was always kind of the same job, yeah. um, which was just like run the coffee sourcing. But just took them a, a while to realize what you were actually doing. Like, oh, right, we're actually like, yeah. coffee. Yeah, or just like yeah. eventually I think it was just like, I would just maybe be like, I think I'm doing a different job here. Like than what we said, and maybe it was my own ego that is like, I, just, I think it's a head of coffee show. Um, yeah. But yeah, so it was always kind of, um, they had done direct trade before, but sort of taking that as expanding out from, I think they had like maybe one or two, the two countries that they were doing it from and then bringing it over to be about a dozen countries um across latin america and africa so that was just years of going to coffee farms which i think was like an incredibly formative period um it's like it can get a little hard like always living on the road mm -hmm. but it's incredible to spend so much time with producers and yeah. visit just hundreds and hundreds of farms. Was that your first experience on going to Origin when, yeah. when you're with Origin? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was actually, yeah. Nice. And so it was like it, it was it was really great. It was like mostly I think by the last year I was doing it, I think I realized every other night of the my the year was spent at Origin. Yeah, well, so it was like quite a bit of a uh, travel. Yeah. Um, it was really good. And then that nice. sort of led into doing more of that for like Kiss the Hippo and but it was really at the origin on coffee farms that I started thinking about like coffee leaf, which is the stuff that I, I do a lot of now, where it's just seeing how I have like a strong memory of working with producers and being like, how much does it cost to buy land here? And then working out like how much coffee do you brew is like, you'll never be able to like make more money to buy more land to increase your income to yeah. get out of your situation. Did, did you ever actually like express that or no? Yeah, no, we yeah. full on like in Kenya, I did it. One day, El Salvador, like, like sat down and we were just like, like, how does this like work yeah. financially to get out of this situation? What was there? Were they just like, yeah, it sucks. Or were they blind belief that it was going to get better? Or? Um, I think that like, there's a lot of like, yeah, this is a problem. Um, the sea market, like the commodity market hasn't shifted. I think there's like a group, there was a growing kind of thing that specialty was good, but it wasn't enough. But yeah. there's like, it's helping a lot of people, but a lot of people's farms like if you were the best farms in the world, like you're Esmeralda, you're still doing commodity coffee because not all farms can make 100% high, high-end coffee. Yeah. So it's there's this whole, how do we increase everything up a lot? Uh, the and, commodity almost gives them like a stable like bottom. Yeah, you get a lot of like producers who will say like, commodity coffee is how I so break so even. Yeah. Specialty is how I like live. Yeah. There was a bit of that happening. Like that's that's a bit, you know, like I was talking about a house blend. It's like, yeah. I'm, I'm not I'm not trying to compare us at all to like, a, you know, I'm not being insensitive, but you know, that's, you know, having something that's like, just takes care of itself almost. Yeah. And then like the stuff that you want to, again, not like for us have fun with is like some of the single origin stuff. But I guess uh, for them, it's slightly different situation. You know? yeah. It's like trying to actually make a living. Um, yeah, that's fascinating. So uh, your first time there, did you have a spark of an idea or did your brain start thinking about coffee leaf as a, uh, why are people not brewing this or like, I like tea yeah. or. I'd like read that in the, um, what was it? The world fair or something in London in the 1800s, they tried to introduce coffee leaf. Yeah. I'd, I don't know where I had stumbled upon this and like, and then I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then when I was doing competition, um, it, it, that's where it originally started as like, oh, I want to do a signature drink where I use like most of the tree. And they're like, oh, cool, do the leaves. And so Carlos Pola, who uh, partner heads in, does the the first like does the leaves for us. Um, him and I worked on it, trying to like figure out how to like turn it into a tea. 
And it was a pretty rustic version of what we now have, but it was like, you know, we dried them out and we're like, this is all right. It's like, I don't know if it's really like safe to consume <laughs> because coffee farms are the most, like everything gets roasted. So they're, they're not really built for like end consumer stuff. So it's changed a lot since then, but that was like the first version of like, oh, cool. Like this tastes quite nice. Or was it, was we guys just like drying the leaf out? Yeah, basically. Just... Well, we were doing like watching YouTube videos on how tea's made. Yeah. And then like, rolling it. Yeah, we were just trying stuff. And so like, but he, he tried a ton of stuff because he's just a really, he's really big into um, how to lower the waste of a coffee farm. He's really big into like trying to make specialty coffee actually work financially. And yeah. um, El Salvador has seen such a collapse in coffee that his farm is surrounded by farms just gone completely back to forest or just like soil eroded down into like so like just in like sand um so he has a high awareness of like something needs to change but he's so he's really experimental generally so he's like quite nice i mean like yeah cool let's do this um and then was yeah but it just started as like i don't know let it dry and we'll taste it and like that was pretty bad okay so like <laughs> how do we make it better how do we i mean just yeah. kept refining it and was it when you were obviously so the the concept developed into a routine but like was there always a kind of curiosity of like how that could work in like a a cold drink or like a soda you wouldn't call this a soda maybe yeah. but like a or a seltzer like what would you what would you call it uh so we got you, oh, you call it seltzer because it's pretty light but like no i think it, it sat in my brain like coffee leaves quite cool too bad you can't replace tea bags yeah. <laughs> like that it would just be too hard yeah um and then it wasn't until covid when I don't know if you, you had this, but like I was in like we're in lockdown, um, and I'd like decided to get like a beer subscription and my partner had a wine subscription. I was like, we're now like I don't really want to drink all this stuff at home. We're not doing anything, and then that's so I started getting into making like healthy drinks just so I could have replicate like a beer at the end of the day without kind of the sadness of drinking alone. Um, cool. And then I was like, oh cool, coffee like this could be a thing for coffee leaf. Yeah, I've uh, Harris. At Cohen is probably very bored of me talking about yeah. it. But I've forever been obsessed with the idea of creating a coffee soda, and I'm like, yeah. I don't really know what that means. But <laughs> yeah, but I'm like, I can imagine like making coffee ready to drink is like such a cool process. Yeah, and obviously cold brew is the the kind of proven market. Um, but like doing something a bit different is, I think it's really really admirable, but also and cool. Like and obviously really delicious. But like having a product where you are to um, a degree like first to market, like do you see that as an opportunity or do you see that as a challenge? Yeah, it's funny. There's like um, very few people around the world who have done it. And like there was, there's, a, there's actually someone in Canada who's done it. Like we talked a little bit and it talks a little bit about this like, yeah, just trying to like, we, we just need more people to be aware of it. But yeah, yeah absolutely in the UK, yeah, I'm definitely like, the first person to be like, have you tried coffee leaf? And like, they're like, no, I didn't know there were leaves. Um, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think it's kind of a, it's it's something we spend a lot of time in like on the can itself. Like we recently just added this like made from coffee leaf tastes nothing like coffee because it was like the number one question every shop got asked. Uh, so it was like, what does it taste like? Um, I was going to ask you like how, how many iterations you came up with to come up with tagline, but yeah, like, taglines like, are hard to come up with. Hey, that was like, yeah, it was funny because I've, I think we had like a two hour session I was chatting about it and that was like at the end of it you know when you do like so are, is this what we're saying and then it was like it just kind of came out but yeah it's been a to explain to people that it tastes so different but because coffee has its own like assumptions of flavor yeah. um, that has definitely been like the hard thing and so like when you're kind of first trying to show people like oh this is well, you know this is tastes refreshing or this tastes like citrusy or this tastes like this um, there's a lot of explaining and since coffee's kind of or like this is sort of funny because it just lives on a shelf it's not like a barista you know brewing it for you it has to kind of do a lot of heavy lifting just uh on the can yeah so we were talking earlier about um like the advantage that it has as a product to be able to be opened and drunk like this yeah where if you sell one of these to a, a business like ourselves you have basically a hundred percent faith in what we are tasting. Yeah. But like obviously even with coffee, like when we sell to Paradox as an example, they ordered this week, which is great, but we don't know like what it takes, tastes like with their filters and like their uh, water, like it's so many variations of like expression with coffee that mm. it's pretty terrifying to a degree, but, uh, especially in the UK where the water is so different from everywhere, yeah. like London water is like horrible. 
Yeah. And Paradox is funny because they uh, theirs is like among the best because they like refill and like have their own containers of water that they do oh, themselves. Well, for food, just for filter, just no, just for all their coffee because they're a little like they're not plumbed in as a stand. And so they, uh, so it's like some of the best coffee you'll get anywhere because not London water. Um, but yeah, if you come up here, you then get like, oh, there's such good water in like Cornwall. Yeah. Like okay. My partner, when she's from there, we go take water from the tap. Coffee's like the best oh, really? anywhere in the country. So we cop, uh, and this is like a transparency thing. I keep on feeling like this is a dirty secret, but we yeah. do all our QC with just tap water. Yeah. Um, partially because we, in the old grocery, didn't have a filter. And we're like, we didn't know how temporary it was going to be. So we're like, let's just not bother putting infrastructure in place. But then it like tasted like fine. And my, uh, my brain always kind of thought, well, if it tastes good with tap water. It's probably going to taste better with filtered water. That's probably completely like Maxwell would probably tell me I'm completely wrong yeah. for saying that. But um, that's the the decision that I've made up in my head and I'm just going with it. But I know when we were doing QC at Origin, we'd do it in Cornwall. This is before I moved to London while working for them. If we got a, like a complaint in London and then we had tasted in Cornwall, we we're like, this tastes amazing. I don't know, like we do, like it would be that like frustrating thing of like, you know, when you're kind of like, oh, they're wrong, it's yeah. not good. And then once we started doing it in London as well, it was like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. So you you got to make it taste like for the worst case, not the the best case. During um during COVID again, because like you say, we all had time our hands and like fun projects. Like one of the kind of relationships I sparked up again was with Alex. Like Moose, like from Caravan, yeah. um, who's like involved with the kind of quality roasting team there. Uh, he used to work with us, and he went down, and he was still pretty like engaged with like what we were doing. And uh, I used to send like all of our roast down, just because yeah. I was like, I'm, I'm basically using my own here. Let's see what someone else thinks. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was really interesting to get his feedback from like using London water or or their filtration. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, yeah, it was the same thing. Like sometimes it's something that I thought tasted great. Uh, he was like, it tastes pretty flat. And some things that he thought tasted really good, I was like, ah, oh, it's weird because I'm not really vibing on it. Yeah. It was almost like everything was back to front, which is, yeah. But that's what I mean, like pretty terrifying. So uh, you're now in a position where there's confidence in what you're serving, which is cool. Yeah. That's part of the reason why like, I like the can ideas. Like, yeah. so I, do, I wanted at least with Coffee Leaf when we first introduced it to be something that, yeah, you 100% knew what someone was having. Mm. So if they didn't like it, it's like, that's fine. Yeah. But there was none of this, like, oh, you have to brew it, you have to do this yeah. with it before you can have it. And, like, you know, you have to weigh it out and all all that extra education. It felt like we have so much education just around what it is, yeah. let alone how to prepare it. And Because, yeah. you know, coffee world, I feel like years, we're still spending time in kind of the coffee bean world telling people to weigh things. It's so much of a battle <laughs> or, like, yeah. trying fresh um to get the best of your coffee so this was like nice to just be like open it up and drink yeah it. definitely we, we've been trying to think about uh again partially to do with like taglines but more just a, a kind of culture that exists within the kind of what we do and uh i'm getting closer to formulating that but yeah. it's probably gonna have something to do with like breaking rules and like i just don't think um rules and coffee are a fun engaging way to yeah. to be serving something but um yeah, one of the kind of outliers for that is like I do think like scales are pretty pretty important, but yeah. um yeah. I guess this is this mitigates like having coffee in a can, although this isn't coffee technically of a <laughs> of sorts. Um uh it mitigates that having to worry about yeah, uh, really. faff. Um the user and ginger part I'm yeah. really intrigued about like were there a lot of variations to get to or or quite early on did you think those are quite trendy? And our delicious taste and notes, or not taste and notes, flavor enhancements, I guess. That would... I, I mean, I've done a lot of like um, product development stuff and like um, like cocktail stuff in the past. And so, like, like, it was actually just like a piece of paper writing like combinations and then being like, of like things that I thought was delicious. Yeah. Um, and like, y- Yuzu is, it, it's funny because I maybe I, I do wonder if I'd made my job harder by using Yuzu because like, not many people know what Yuzu is. Um, but it is delicious, and yeah. so it was. Uh, it was kind of always on there. Like oh, I want it to be citrusy because uh, I don't know if you have this, but like you remember when you were like a barista and you'd come in, you're hungover, and you'd have like no, nah, never once, um, and you like couldn't have coffee anymore, but you needed something, and it would often be like a canned drink. Like for me, it was like a lemonade or something. I was like oh, I want to do a lemonade, but 
like lemons like i don't feel like it's like interesting enough i want to do something a little more elevated than more complex yeah you have like, different hangovers to me I, yeah, yeah, yeah i wasn't concerned about the complexity of lemonade well this is i wanted like a posh version or yeah. like a nicer version of that feeling of like when you cracked open a lemonade and be like oh god like that's... non-passive <laughs> yeah yeah and so but it's one of the like it's that feeling of really really refreshing that sort of sorts you out yeah. um and so you, it was a lot of citrus kind of stuff and then it just was eventually like after writing down, I was like, I think yuzu and ginger is like a delicious combination. So I'll do that one. And I also trying to find something that there wasn't someone already doing, yeah. which was kind of hard because there's a million flavors out there. Uh-huh. And I hadn't had a yuzu and ginger drink before. So I was like, cool, that'll be the one. Do, do you think there's like an element of um, like obviously thinking about it, like psychology of sales that um, even if someone's kind of done something, it's it makes there's reassurance that it's accepted yeah. or whatever. I think about like apple and blackcurrant. It's like a really classic, yeah, like combination because Robinsons have been doing it for I don't know how many years, a hundred years or something. Yeah, um, it's quite interesting. But I do think like ginger and citrus is is a like a combination which is like universally accepted as yeah. like a good a good one. It's quite funny. One of the things I find really interesting here, I've not properly deep dived on your ingredient list, but jalapeno chili yeah uh, extract is interesting. It doesn't have that. Um, like uh intense heat but obviously yeah. i probably was associating any heat with gingery but i know um do you know rap scallion so yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah so gregor has been doing these like videos the last few days on his instagram and uh he was talking through what's in his like ginger ninja uh, drink yeah and he's got um a pimento and some kind of chili and i was like what the fuck that's yeah. weird but uh it's interesting that there's lots of stuff in here, um, but they all like just add balance and it's not yeah. kind of, nothing kind of fights for, uh, which I guess is similar to coffee in essence. It's like the best coffees are probably the most balanced coffees. They're, yeah. They're all kind of. It's funny with ginger because like, yeah, you add it and you're like at no sensation because not really heat, but just like sensation weirdly from like when you create, a, not a juice, but like a, a, a infusion from ginger, you get juice ginger kind of thing. Um, and so the jalapeno is like to add that sensation, um, because the ginger just doesn't add it, yeah. but it does. So it does like a flavor job, but weirdly doesn't give you much of that. And so just, I mean, there isn't like much heat in it. It's just more of uh, how it balances out the acidity. Cause I think you're right. It's like, how do you create that balance? And you've got, you know, sweetness, you've got bitterness, but you've also got like, I think the body and the sensation yeah. of the drink. And so I didn't want it to be too acidic. And so the jalapeno weirdly without it feels less like it feels way too, more acidic and it feels like a little bit too sharp and yeah. so it just kind of calms it down a little nice yeah. that's interesting i'm just thinking about time i'm yeah. concerned yeah. about it um so i'll just do one yeah. one two really quick one i'm um, just about like so going from to, to this extent in your career obviously yeah. you've still got like um some other bits and pieces going on but kind of carving your own path i suppose yeah like how have you found that how have you found like the process of being responsible for decision like again like you've had had the responsibility for decision making but like you know i find it can be quite um scary <laughs> like, yeah. to be like well i'm gonna make this decision and no one's here to tell me i'm wrong so yeah. like, how have you found that i mean like when you have a job i think it always kind of sits in your head of, like you can leave that job well like when you start something you're kind of like i guess i'm gonna do that for like a long fucking time yeah. and then there's so there's a bidding me on the pressure of like i hope this decision is good because this is good. I'm going to have to live with this for a while, especially when you're starting out. Cause you're like, you can't do all that much. Right. So anytime you choose like packaging or you choose anything, you're kind of like, well, that's what it's going to be for a little while. Yeah. I hope it works. Um, so funny. and so I do think, I think it's more of the pressure around like, God, I hope this works. Uh, yeah. because like, I, cause you don't get to change it that often. You like, it's funny when you see big companies and let like throw massive money away on like oh let's get rid of that product or whatever yeah. but when you're kind of starting something small like if you bought like a pallet of coffee i'm sure you're like it sucked <laughs> like that's like a big deal <laughs> it's yeah like hard yeah uh, or more often just like yeah buying too much and the, yeah. the market and all being there for it or something that's like yeah score i was big uh big biggest tips always like buy what you need right yeah. now but not what you you think you need to um in terms of like uh yeah making decisions on this we talked earlier a bit about yeah. like gut instinct and yeah. how actually probably if you'd kind of allowed your gut to, to be the 
the player and decision making you might have ended at this sooner or yeah i think they're like um in the first round um because like it's like oh this is a new thing it's weird so i'll make it like so you should make it more approachable and familiar and, and like it but i think that what that eventually sits in is like a disconnect between you the person and the thing that you you make and so although i really liked it i think what i liked about um having people like carrie and chris who have joined the, the company and like done this design is that it's been a really fun exercise to be like no no we should do the weirder thing like the option should be the weirder thing because yeah. it's the thing that i think seems to resonate more with people because so I don't, know, I don't know if you have this but like so many folks can be quite safe and like and so you get kind of lost in the mix of safeness and then Definitely. you just fade into the background of the lid becomes like well, what i think there's always a lingering like um like i think most businesses feel like they want to be a little bit edgy yeah but they like some businesses have more of that like uh voice of reason that's like oh but that's you know let's just be anchored in like a safe harbor where we know people are buying this so yeah you know, like uh with yeah we the coffee packaging we're in the middle of like trying to make changes and yesterday i was like that's it we're gonna go full edgy yeah. but then this morning i woke up and i was like ah but maybe maybe that's too much but i yeah it's interesting i think in a in a market where it's is com so competitive Absolutely. it's almost like you kind of have to give it a shot i do think like what have you got to lose as well it's like oh yeah i think it, money but i mean yeah, i think you just have that internal voice sometimes of like is that what's that simpsons things when homer is like i'm not cool enough to be different <laughs> so you're like trying to put something like is this is this good <laughs> like, yeah. or is this just like me being like or do i have shit to and you're like it's a lot of like insecurity right and yeah. i i think that's probably sometimes the hardest bit is like just like getting through your own insecurities on like, well, people even fucking like this or is this just like me making stuff up? Definitely. Um, and I do think it's a little bit better maybe just take a risk on hopefully they'll like it yeah. than doing something super safe that people are just kind of muh about. Yeah, I guess like um, the concern is always like, oh, it's got to be something that's credible within yeah. your like audience or marketplace. But then if it gets to the point where it's not credible to like you as a as a person or like what you think is good and i think that makes it a lot harder to be authentic and to actually go there and like sell that yeah. as like an extension of you because like people talk about your business being an extension of like mm -hmm. your personality almost so it's, i kind of think uh it can be harder to to get energized and like wake up in the morning when it's not something you're like totally 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 cool with i guess so i guess that's another another shout towards you know doing whatever Whatever you want, basically. Yeah, with yeah it makes you excited. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Listen, that's been super interesting. I think like, we had a lot of conversation off camera, which, um, <laughs> but hopefully there's some value in there for people to, to hear from at home. Um, and in terms of people buying a headstand, you're selling some online. Yeah, yeah. So you can get it online, but also like shops like uh, Karen Gorm and mm -hmm. so we're in coffee shops and a little bit more going to grocery, but that's more in kind of London. But yeah, your local coffee shops cool. really. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming down. Yeah, man. Thanks for asking. How's the first guest pod? There we go. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, if you like it, let us know. If you've got any comments, you can add them. We can always relay them to to Josh ourselves somehow. Um, let you all know what you're saying. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks again for coming. Thank you. See you all soon.